So I'm teaching money and banking. I taught it last semester. I'm teaching it again. I guess I was either so good at it or they had so many students who needed to take it that they asked me to do it. And uh, the main question that came to mind is how do we get from our original monetary standard, which is a gold, silver standard, to our current standard, which is fiat money? We all know that this happened, but how exactly did it happen? And I, I never found a clear exposition of the story in one source. It's all scattered throughout all its different kinds of sources. So my goal here is just to tell the story in a very concise manner, in a very simple manner, in one simple uh, source, hopefully create kind of a handy reference to tell the story. Before I begin, though, I'll just tell you why I'm interested in monetary debasement. I've known about this for quite some time. I read Murray Rothbard's little, great little book, What Has Government Done to Our Money? I've been aware of this for a long time, but what really got me interested in it was a couple, of, a year or two ago, I started hoarding pennies. Uh, in, the, in the recent boom, commodities prices rose, including copper. Uh, U.S. pennies that were made before 1983 are full copper. They uh, obtained a bullion premium, so they're actually worth more than face value, so they started getting hoarded out of circulation and sold. Uh, you'd sell these pennies for one and a half, two times space value, right? This is Gresham's law in action. And I was actually engaged in this process. I found it pretty fascinating. I've always been a coin collector. So I was a penny hoarder. And that brings up the questions, brings up all these issues of monetary uh, economics. Gresham's law, debasement of the coinage. The penny was debased down to zinc so that this bullion premium issue would go away. It's not, it's not a legal debasement because the penny was never a legal standard, but it's still essentially a debasement, lightening of the coin and changing of the metal of the coin. So that got me really interested going through this process of uh, monetary debasement. First off, just go to the roots of the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is based on the Spanish mill dollar. This is the most prevalent coin in circulation in early America. And this coin has a long track record. It started in the late 1400s in Spain, and uh, it was initially established at this weight here, about 420, around 420 grains. And it was ne really never debased, because the Spaniards found so much silver in the New World, they really didn't see a need to debase this coin, ever. And it was uh, in circulation in the U.S. until the 1850s. It became the Mexican silver dollar, of course, after Mexican independence. Of course, eventually the Mexicans found it necessary to start debasing the coinage around 1900. This coin had a long track record. It was very uh, reliable. And especially once... Oh, to show the um, prevalence of this coin... Continental currency was denominated in Spanish mill dollars. Of course, it was never paid off in Spanish mill dollars, so that's another story. The technology, the Spaniards came up with this technology of milling the edge of the coin, making it perfectly round and putting a, a little pattern in the edge. This prevented uh, shaving of the coin. This made it a highly reliable coin. The previous coins were very uh, apt to be shaved, and they weren't very reliable at all. Of course, we're all familiar with the monetary provisions of the Constitution. Uh, only Congress can, can coin money. All the monetary powers are with Congress. The states have none. We should, hopefully, we're all familiar with this. But there's one thing to note here. There's no strict limitation on Congress's power to emit bills of credit. This was actually debated during the Constitutional Convention, and it was narrowly defeated to actually have a strict prohibition. Congress cannot emit bills of credit. So we've got a little opening of the door for the national government to print money. We get the dollar defined in 1792. It's basically just copied off the Spanish mill dollar. The dollar, the unit, which Jefferson called it the unit of the United States is going to be the Spanish mill dollar. Three and uh, 371 grains of fine silver. So that's the net silver content. And then Hamilton says, well, we got to have bimetallism so we can increase the money supply. So at the prevailing market ratio, which is 15 to 1, that becomes the mint ratio. So you divide 371 by 15, you get 24 grains of gold. Here's the coins they produced initially. An eagle, $10, $5, uh, 250 Later on, we added a dollar, a $3, and a $20. These are the United States mint produced coins. And then the silver coins, dollar, and its divisions down to 5 cents. It's all proportional, of course. Then the copper, which is not uh, a legal standard, but it's used for small change because it's hard to make a silver coin that's small enough to be useful. The copper cent used to be huge. It used to be about the size of a modern-day half dollar, and then the half cent, of course. 
<coughs> kind of shows the progress of inflation. A half cent used to be a highly relevant coin. And it, it ceased to be uh, minted in the 1850s. And of course, we start off with private banknotes, the first bank of issue, uh, Bank of North America, and then the first, second bank of the United States. Then all kinds of state chartered banks are issuing banknotes throughout this period. Now, these are just claims on money, right? These are money substitutes. The one feature they all have in common is payable to bearer on demand. That's a feature every single uh, private issue bank note has. The circulation is subject to trust, of course. You have to take the bank's word for it, so the reputation is at play to establish circulation. And to uh, actual redemption of the notes, there has to be some kind of redemption of the notes going on, otherwise they won't circulate. We have the development of these banknote reporters that tell you how reliable they are, too. There's publications put out. The uh, banknote reporters tell you that the banknote's good, essentially, by telling you the price. Is it traded par or at a discount? I want to just comment here on the, on the idea of fractional reserve banking vis-a-vis -vis debasement. Fractional reserve note issue, of course, they're going to issue more notes than they have uh, specie to pay out these notes. But I'm going to argue that this is not a debasement unless the following prevails. The banks are legally allowed to suspend their specie payments or there's some kind of legal tender uh, status attached to the notes through the law. But as long as the bank's bank note issue is free and competitive, that is the banks are free to go bust if they're and the notes are free to fall, the price of the notes is free to fall in the market, that doesn't constitute debasement. There's no change to the legal standard. That's just the private uh, business failing failing to meet its obligations. Here's some examples of private bank notes. They all have this feature. Table, bearer on demand, bearer on demand, bearer on demand. They got pretty, um, the engraving got pretty sophisticated eventually to both show the quality and to deter counterfeiting. Speaking of suspension of species payments, here's sort of a, a brief historical outline. Always associated with wars and then financial panics. There are 10 species suspensions that I have identified, and the last three are final. I'll get into more detail on those. Of course, with a bimetallic standard, you're going to have changes in the market uh, price ratio of gold to silver. And that's going to drive one coin or the other out of circulation according to the operation of Gresham's Law. And the government's always uh, late to catch up first adjustment happens in 1834, and some authors have identified it as a cr the crime of 1834 because the weight of the gold dollar was reduced. So if you had a contract from before 1834 and you get paid off and post-1834 dollars, you're actually getting cheated a little, 6.3% debasement. One thing that I found interesting, though, is that the U.S. Mint always signaled its debasements it would change the coin. So here's, a pre, here's an 1834 quarter eagle. It's got E pluribus unum. 1835 quarter eagle, they take that off. So you can readily identify the uh, content of the coin just by some kind of device that they change on it. And this is the famous 16 to 1 mint ratio that's established in 1834, which this is a, what the silver rights want to reestablish later on. <coughs> Then the next thing happens in 1853 with the gold rush. Now gold is replacing silver in circulation. All the especially small change silver coins are being hoarded out. The silver dollar is basically has been irrelevant for a long time. It hasn't even been minted. But the small change silver starts to get hoarded out. So there's a small change crisis. It actually starts about 1850. And people are paying off in pennies. It's like People are carrying sacks and sacks of pennies around. It's, it's, it's quite a problem. So the Congress debase of silver now to make up for this. And actually, not just to match the market ratio, but to go a little under to make the coins basically a fiat coin. It's overvalued by 3% so to try to guarantee that these coins will still circulate. Yeah, this is, this is because of the Gresham's Law problem. But once again, they tell us what they're doing. There's 1853. 1853 with arrows at the date, and then they put these rays on the back. So they're letting us know that they're changing the weight of the coin. I can, I can tell you off the top of my head. Silver was debased by 7%. Well, it was. that's the market ratio, so it's going to be close to that, yeah. 
Private coinage was uh, issued on the U.S. standard throughout the, well, from 1830 until the 1860s. Several different states where there were gold uh, discoveries. I wanted to just point out a few features here, though. These coins were, uh, you know, this was competitive coin issue, and it, the quality varied. The Beckler coins from the Carolinas, they displayed the weight and the fineness. You know, very reliable coin. And the assays proved that these coins uh, turned out to be pretty, pretty, pretty solid, pretty reliable. The U.S. Mint was always very good, but the U.S. Mint about its quality, but the, not its quantity. So private individuals had to step in and fill the need. California gold, there's lots of different companies. There's 15 different companies in California. You'll notice this coin here, which is a double eagle, looks just like the U.S. Uh, government issue. The only differences are instead of Liberty on the headband, we've got the name of the uh, private company. So very good uh, substitutes and competition. we got a vari variation in quality. The Mormon coins are the worst. But, uh, you know, people, people are going to know that. They're going to be assayed, and people are going to trade those coins at a discount. We have Colorado Gold, Oregon Gold, all these different companies, just lots of private coinage uh, circulating. Works pretty well. And now we come to a major debasement, the greenback issue. We'll see that they're, they have to be modeled after private banknotes, payable to bearer, but not on demand. This is, of course, a uh, legal tender law, the force of circulation, massive inflation, $450 million worth authorized. That's on top of initial money supply, $745 million. And then we finally get redemption. But let me just point out the legal tender claim. This notice is legal tender for all debts, public and private. We're familiar with that. Except duties on imports and interest on the public debt. And this is the loan payment of all loans to the United States. Yeah, the government kept, uh, the government paid interest on the debt in specie. I think this is to uh, encourage people to continue buying U.S. bonds. But it's, we start now with a legal tender claim. And it's a pretty extensive legal tender claim. The national banking system that's uh, established during the Civil War gives us national banknotes. They tax the state banknotes out of existence. National banknotes secured by U.S. bonds. Um, they've got a kind of a legal tender status. They're receivable in government taxes. Not all debts public and private yet. They, and they are redeemable, but there's some there's a catch to the redemption here. You have to go to the home office of the bank. Um, so, and, but the currency is uniform. So all national currency looks the same. So the, if you can get your national bank notes circulated on the other side of the country, chances are you're never going to get redeemed. Besides, the government guarantees redemption anyway, so you can still fail and the government's going to take care of the note. So redemption basically grinds to a halt during the national bank note era. But the legal tender claim and then the counterfeit claim is so extensive on these that if you fold it in half, it'd basically be a book. That's the, uh, the process here of, developing the legal tender money. And then here's the here's next phase here. They, they all look the same, only the uh, name of the bank issue changes. Eventually it starts to look like modern currency. And here's the obligation. It's pretty similar to uh, United States notes. We also have gold certificates, because gold is still being used. These are basically strictly to economize on uh, gold coin circulation. We come to the crime of 1873, much talked about, but it's really not a debasement. This is just, we're, we're going to stop mining the silver dollar because uh, mint ratios or the market ratios changed so much. So it's not a debasement. Although the silverites want uh, silver dollars to still be minted to inflate the currency, to, uh, to keep the interests of the silver miners going, so they eventually get some silver minted. And then the silver that does get minted gets turned into silver certificates. But the main thing I want to point out here is these silver certificates are now a fiat money. The, the, mon the metal value of the coin is far below the face value. So we get a little bit of fiat money inflation starting off with silver certificates in the 1970s. So there's a step in the movement towards fiat money. These last until actually 1968, not all that long ago. And the obligation there have been deposited one silver dollar. It's actually, it's a, it's a good claim. It's true. This is what the modern ones look like. Treasury notes are basically the same thing as silver certificates, although it says in coin, so the government can choose gold or silver, depending on however the uh, market ratio works out. The Gold Standard Act is not a debasement either. It just says the government's going to redeem treasury notes in gold, basically. 
Now, okay, we come to Federal Reserve notes, finally. Initially, this, it says 40% uh, gold backing, redeemable in gold. Right? They've got to be, because they've, it's got to be copied off the previous uh, issue. This, this gets changed only gradually, I want to point out. First, we've got the 1933 uh, gold confiscation. It's reduced to lawful money. And then, after 1963, it's just legal tender. So this is kind of a long requirement. And we've got lots of different currencies circulating. Federal Reserve notes, of course, are eventually going to take over. They're going to kick out gold certificates, national currency, uh, greenbacks, United States notes, and then silver certificates. And now it's just Federal Reserve. We have the suspension of specie payments from FDR in 1933, confiscation of the citizens' gold in 1933, and then the authorization of the president to actually reduce the gold to devalue the dollar in 1934. So we go from 24.75 grains to 15 grains. In other words, uh, $35 an ounce. But it doesn't really matter anymore because there's no redemption of uh, notes for U.S. citizens. This only matters now for foreign central banks. I want to point out one thing I find interesting is the, uh, the notes look the same since uh, the late 1920s, but the obligation on them subtly changes. This is a Federal Reserve note, redeemable in gold coin. This is a Federal Reserve note that looks almost exactly the same, redeemable in lawful money, which is now just greenbacks, or silver, which is fiat money. This looks almost exactly the same, but it's just a legal tender. No, no redemption claim at all. We get this uh, debasement of silver, minor silver coin. Again, they look almost exactly the same. The half dollars are done in a two-step process. They go up 90%, 40%, 0%. -0%. It always looks exactly the same. It's always a very subtle and drawn-out process. That's the main point I'm trying to make. Nixon closes the gold window. This is from his uh, address. I don't have time to read this, but I, I find it very interesting that he wanted to lay the rest of bugaboo of what is called devaluation. Of course, it, didn't, it doesn't matter for American citizens anymore because we can redeem since, uh, since 1933 anyway. American citizens could still trade in their dollars for silver until 1968 because the price of silver actually rises to where it's no longer fiat money, so they get rid of the redemption of silver certificates. And now we're fully fiat currency since 1971. So the main point I want to make is that this is a long, drawn-out process. It's not a sudden event. It's not a policy. There's five major steps in the debasement that I've identified. And then there's, there's steps towards debasement, and then there's steps back from debasement. We've got the greenbacks, but then those actually get redeemed. That's a good, a good step backwards. Then there's lots of different minor steps. The adjustments of the mint ratio, debasement of the small coinage, suspensions of BC, legal tender uh, laws, and all this. It's a long, drawn-out process. There's lots of different embodiments of U.S. currency. And the step-by-step -step process, each currency has to kind of model its uh, ancestor with slight changes. And it brings, the, the question it brings forth is, when we're asking why does it happen, well, we've got to look at the politics of inflation, right? What's the demand for the change in these notes? It's not just the government trying to rip us off by changing the currency. It's lots of different interest groups wanting to change the currency for their own benefit. That's, a, that's the main point I'm trying to make. Okay? Thank you.